All right. Uh, well, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Shailesh Kantak uh, for this month's lecture in the Topics in Rehabilitation Science series. Uh, Dr. Kantak is the Director of the Neuroplasticity and Motor Behavior Lab at MRRI and is also an Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Physical Therapy at Arcadia University. Uh, Dr. Kontak received his BSc and MSc in physical therapy from Mumbai University with a specialization in neurologic physical therapy. He then completed his PhD in biokinesiology at the University of Southern California and his postdoctoral training at uh, Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which is now called the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, and the University of Maryland. Uh, Dr. Kontak's research aims to understand neurobehavioral mechanisms that underlie the control and learning of goal-directed actions after neurological damage uh, with the overarching goal of designing and testing novel evidence-based rehabilitation strategies. Uh, so without further ado, uh, welcome to Dr. Kontak and I will turn the floor over. Thank you so much, Amanda. So if I am speaking to you and looking around that's because i have like three other screens so i have you on a different screen um, um so thank you for uh being here and i am going to um uh, talk to you about this um new area of so i have become interested in um and it's it's uh there, there has been a lot of work in with uh effects of attentional focus, motor performance um, and learning in um, typically uh, or in neurotypical individuals. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested in how does this affect um, instructions for uh, motor, improving motor performance and learning in patients with neuromuscular disorders. Um, so, so today's Schreier Family Visiting Scholar Lecture is supported by a generous gift from Nancy and Mark Schreier, and we are extremely grateful for their support and uh, their uh, and uh, their belief in our mission. Here are the objectives of the presentation. Um, so, a lot of emerging work from uh, sports psychology and clinical research has supported that um, one factor that influences outcomes is how um, clinician uh, communicates with their clients to either inspire or motivate them to move or practice differently. Um, and this effect, which often uh, uh, is described as a part of therapeutic alliance, um, really relies on how effectively the clinician instructs and provides feedback about their patient's movement or their patient's activity. And therefore, it is important uh, from a practical perspective to understand how instructions and feedback uh, influence movement and motor performance as well as learning. Um, now, instructions, uh, so we are going to focus this talk mainly on instructions. Um, and these instructions are often given prior to movement uh, execution, um, and they provide information about clues on how to be successful or efficient in the motor performance. Um, often these instructions are filled, are filled with uh, um, they are filled with a lot of information about um, either the rules of the game or the nature of the task. Information is given about what are multiple different ways in which you can actually accomplish the task and which of the which of those ways is often the best way. Um, and in doing so, these instructions can often help uh, or direct the learner's attention um, to a different as to different aspects of the task or environment. Now, while there are multiple pieces of information that are provided during instruction, uh, during instructions, um, one dimension along which instructions are often manipulated uh, in the clinic, as well as in the field, as well as in research, is where the learner's attention is directed to 
during movement. Now, broadly speaking, uh, attention uh, can be biased uh, through instructions uh, to either a task relevant external effects of an intended action. Um, alternately, those instructions can be directed uh, can, can direct the learner to focus on specific body movements or some mechanics of the action. Um, so to give you an example, um, we, we all know, those of us who work with stroke patients, uh, patients who have stroke, uh, know that when they reach to grasp something, they actually move more with their trunk. So there is a greater amount of trunk movement, despite of sometimes having the capability to really extend their, their arm. So an externally focused um, instruction might be to keep to asking them to keep their back close to the chair as much as they can while they um, reach to the jar. So the focus is on the chair so that making sure that they are as close to the chair as possible while they reach forward to grasp the jar. Alternately, um, an internal focused instruction would be um, to focus, uh, to ask them to try and stretch their arm uh, ra uh, rather than move their body forward. So really focusing on the body movement. Um, as a physical therapist, this is something which I have, which I have always seen where patients with stroke often demonstrate that Trendelenburg kind of test, uh, uh, Trendelenburg kind of um, movement where the hip um, of the affected side kind of protrudes out as they are taking a step with the good side. Um, so one may use an externally focused instruction, such as um, I might put, a, put them close to a parallel bar and say that stay away from this bar as you step up. So make sure that you're, you, you're staying away from this, you don't touch this bar. So that would be a more of an external focus. While an internal focus might be to keep your hip right above your knee joint as you step up. So the goal of the movement is the same. However, the instructions that are provided by um, the clinician are focused either on the outcome of the move action or on the, uh, the body postures or body mechanics. Now there is ample of evidence to suggest that external focused instructions are beneficial for performance and, um, and learning. Um, and an example of this study is um, a, a quite well-cited study from uh, Gabby Wolf's lab, uh, where participants were required to learn to balance this tableometer. Um, and one group of participants was instructed to keep the focus on their feet being horizontal. So that was an internal focus condition, where another group was instructed to focus on keeping the two markers, so there were markers here, um, those markers attached to the stabilometer directly in front of their feet horizontal. So that was an external focus. So the task success was essentially the same. Both groups used feedback, but in one group, uh, that is the internal focus group, the attention was directed towards the performer's body movements, while in the external focus group, it was directed towards the effects of the performer's actions on the platform. And what you're seeing on the right, right hand side is uh, the, the uh, performance that is measured in uh, as time um, in balance, which is essentially time during which the, step, the stabilometer was kept horizontal um, over practice trials and then uh, in, uh, on a one day retention test. And what you see is those patients or uh, those, these are, these are, sorry, these are neurotypical healthy uh, adults. Um, what you see is uh, with external focus, there is improved performance um, during practice, as well as uh, that benefit is evident during the retention test. Um, now, Multiple experiments in multiple laboratories, as well as on fields, have supported this benefit of external focus on motor performance and learning. Uh, particularly in the field of sports rehab, this has had a big impact. And I just learned like three weeks ago or so that one of my students uh, from the past um, made a sort of a gaming uh, product using some of these principles 
and that got sold for a million dollars. So I was like, wow. However, these effects are uh, really not without criticisms. And first and foremost, the precise mechanisms that um, implement these differential effects uh, between internal focus and external focus are really not clear. And I'll talk about a few uh, theoretical explanations that have come forth to explain this. And um, you will see that we really do not understand the mechanisms here. Um, further, most studies have measured these effects at a, at, an, at a more of a motor outcome level, so a goal accomplishment level, such as the time on a stabilometer without really paying much attention to the kinematics of the movement. Uh, um, some argue that the benefits of external uh, compared to internal focused instructions might be modulated by initial skill level of um, the learner, um, such that during early learning, we pay a lot of attention to the movements. And so patients may, be, uh, I don't know why I'm saying patients, but the learner may really benefit from um, a more internal focus. However, the research exploring this has um, yielded very ambivalent findings. And finally, uh, of more interest to us is we really do not know how individuals with um, musculoskeletal or neuromuscular injuries respond to these manipulations. So why is um, external focus better than internal focus? And multiple theories have been proposed to explain the beneficial effects of external focus of attention, um, which I feel like are, um, are interesting, but really do not get at the mechanisms. Um, so the first one is the action effect hypothesis. Now this action effect hypothesis um, really suggests that, um, that actions, um, that actions lead to some environmental effects. Um, and these environmental effects then influence our ability to really select and trigger those actions that have led to that desired environmental effect. Um, and so, for example, when you press a switch that results in turning the light on, so the action of pressing the switch and its effects are sort of represented in a common medium without really specifying the details of the joints being involved. So it is that action of switching, which you can do with your finger or with your elbow. Um, and here, you really do not need to identify the movement strategy. And so the idea is that most actions, because they are conceptualized in, um, in, in, in this domain of the effect on the environment, uh, without specifying the, um, the joints that might be used, um, really bias uh, the benefits towards more external focus without, um, you know, However, this, um, this highlights the benefits of external focus, but really does not make any predictions about the effects of internal focus, because that is, they just don't even consider the internal focus here in this hypothesis. The second um, uh, theoretical account um, is uh, called the constrained action hypothesis, where the idea is that most actions are planned in terms of the kinematics of the end effector or the or for example the two or or uh, the tool that is being used such as the golf club so the focus is really on accomplishing the task goal by taking into account the either the end effector or the tool that is being used um, and again this is to accomplish an environmental goal and it, again, this is not in terms of the joint positions. So does this hypothesis suggest that the highest level of motor planning and control um, seems to be in the terms of the kinematics of the end effector, um, and that is driven by the external task goal. And therefore, the instructions given to the learner should be most effective if, it is, uh, if they include the task goal. This hypothesis, however, also posits that when you give an internal focused instructions, 
um, these internal focused instructions induce a sort of a conscious processing of control um, and that conscious processing of control causes the learner to sort of um, constrain their movement system uh, by interfering with this automatic process of task, goal, and action plan. So as you can see, these sort of try to explain um, some of these findings. However, uh, there is very little mechanistic research on why this is happening and how this is happening. So we do not know, there are some open theoretical questions about what are the potential mechanisms through which um, internal focus of attention um, potentially impair motor performance and learning. So um, one way to think about it is, is internal focus of attention kind of creating this dual task situation where you have to attend to the goal, but also now attend to your internal body parts. Is it, is it that that is driving this uh, effect? Um, or is it that the external focus of attention is actually in some way augmenting motor performance of learning? Um, and also, what are the neural basis for these effects? So these are some of the open theoretical questions that um, I think at some level could be um, answered by studying patient population, but we'll come to that later. So this is, uh, this is the state of the theory as of uh, now. So I'm gonna switch gears here and talk about what happens in stroke rehabilitation. So this was a study that was um, conducted in um, by Johnson and colleagues in 2013. And in this was an observational study where they shadowed uh, eight physical therapists. And really um, the, the question was, what kind of instructions are therapists giving patients? Um, and they um, sort of, uh, coded these instructions either as um, internal focus statements, um, such as they were focusing on the body part, external focus statement, and some mixed focus statements. And um, what you can see here is uh, that almost all, across all therapists, um, the, the prevalence of providing internally focused statements was significantly higher. So mostly therapists provide internal uh, focus statements. And this is much in contrast with what one would uh, expect based on uh, the research in healthy controls. So then the next step is to see what happens when, what is, what does, um, do you have a question? Um, what is the, what is the state of research in terms of the effects of focus of attention on motor, motor performance and learning in stroke. Um, there is not much research, but there are few studies, and I'm going to kind of classify those studies as effects of focus of attention on motor performance and uh, motor learning or therapy. So this is um, a summary slide of all the studies that have been done in um, stroke survivors um, for different tasks. And what was manipulated was, um, the focus of attention during that particular tasks. Um, so here are the tasks. So, so many of them are um, balance and walking tasks that show clear benefits of external focus compared to internal focused instructions. Um, while there are, when, we, when it comes to upper extremity tasks that I'm interested in, um, you see that the story is quite ambivalent. So for some studies, some tasks demonstrated um, benefits of uh, external focus, while for some, for other tasks, um, there, there was no beneficial effect of external focus compared to internal focus. Further, when we look at um, studies that have um, tested the effect of focus of attention on learning. So what I showed you before was uh, immediate effect on motor performance without uh, really uh, looking at long-term effects. Um, these are two um, randomized controlled trials that have shown um, almost no differential effect of internal versus external focus on um, arm training, 
uh, on so one study was on arm training on a robotic device, uh, which is the MIT Manus, and here they uh, they they had patients either focus on the screen where the thing was the the task was set up. Uh, it was a, just a planar reaching task, um, and uh, the other one the the internal focus was where that was blocked and the patients were asked to um, focus on their hand and so basically look at their hand and arm while doing this center outreaching task and what they saw was there was no effect on upper extremity fugal mire or wolf motor function test um, essentially suggesting that it's practice but not these um, these manipulations and a similar study was done by cal on balance board stabilization for with practice for three weeks um, suggesting that uh, there are no specific benefits of training with external focus on both of these tasks. So where are we in terms of current evidence? Um, the first is um, at best there is inconsistent evidence for both immediate or performance um, and learning. And there could be multiple reasons why um, we do not see these beneficial effects of external focus uh, in patients with stroke. Um, one could be, one could conceive that patients with stroke are less skilled, um, so internal focus may be, um, may actually, um, maybe sort of, um, so with internal focus might be really helpful um, as they practice these uh, movements where form of the movement is more important. Uh, but we do not have any consistent evidence. Uh, but I would like to think that a part of this story might be buried under the individual differences in stroke survivors. Um, so some research suggests that as individuals, we may have inherent biases in how we move with some people attending to internal versus external focus. So those inherent biases might play in. Um, alternately, uh, with stroke, there are some cognitive deficits that uh, might particularly modulate these effects of internal versus external foci of attention in patients with stroke. So with that, um, we did a small preliminary investigation in our lab. Um, this work was done by uh, two of my stellar research assistants, um, Tessa Johnson and William Marsh. So Will is not with us anymore. Um, and Tessa is still here and Tessa is going to join. Uh, she's going to go in for her PhD at Temple soon. Um, and so this work was uh, basically done by both these guys um, and Tessa led it. So that's what I'm going to present to you. This was published in Human Movement Science. Uh, so given that, um, so we kind of started at a very broad level, thinking about motor control is influenced by sensory, cognitive, and motor execution processes. Um, and these processes can be kind of conceptualized as sensing and perception um, that helps us set a task goal um, based on which we start selecting actions and planning those actions, um, and ultimately, that is uh, later, we execute those actions. Um, and all these processes require, um, you know, sort of organizing the sensory, perceptual, and cognitive processes to execute that particular action. We also know that there are hemispheric differences in uh, how the how these processes are specialized in the right and the left hemisphere. So, uh, for example, we know that perception of the space around us is primarily uh, specialized within the right hemisphere, while processes of action selection and planning are predominantly specialized in the left hemisphere. So, with that broad uh, outlook, we uh, the research question that we asked was, do internally and externally focused instructions affect goal-directed motor performance differently in individuals with right hemisphere damage and left hemisphere damage compared to controls? 
And to test this, we compared the effects of internal and external focus, uh, internal and externally focused instructions on goal directed reach to grasp actions um, during a two step functional task. Um, so the goal was to study reach to grasp, but we uh, we studied a sort of a two step sequential action here. Um, and our hypotheses were that um, in the externally focused condition, individuals with left hemisphere damage will demonstrate poor performance and planning of reach to grasp actions compared to uh, right hemisphere damage and controls. Um, and compared to external focus, internal focus will preferentially impair performance of reach to grasp actions in individuals with LHD compared to RHD. So in both cases, uh, left hemisphere damage patients will show more deficits. Um, yikes, sorry about that. This was supposed to be an animation. Um, this shows I did not practice this, which I should have. Um, so we based our hypotheses on prior research, which had demonstrated that action planning is more specialized um, within the neural networks of the left hemisphere. Thus, when provided with externally focused goals, patients will, with LHD will show um, greater deficits. Um, now, initially, when we planned this experiment, um, we thought that if patients with left hemisphere damage have deficits in planning, by providing um, internally focused instructions, one may think that we are providing a direct solution to the problem. Um, and so we are telling them a strategy of movement. And so that might benefit them. Alternately, we know that some of the action representations are also specialized in the left hemisphere. Um, and so the other hypothesis was that providing internally focused instructions may further deteriorate the performance in left hemisphere damaged individuals. Now, this was supported by a imaging study um, uh, by this work of Zimmerman and colleagues who tested brain activity um, due in healthy controls when they shifted the attention from an internal focus to an external focus. And in another group, uh, tested that in when the focus of attention was changed from external to internal. So in this group, they are um, you know, in the study, they're learning uh, with one focus of attention first and then switching. And so the goal is to see what happens when they switch. So what they found was when they switched to an external focus, there was a, a significantly um, greater activation in the left lateral premotor cortex. Um, potentially reflecting some goal-driven action selection processes. And when they moved from uh, external to internal focus, um, there was a greater activation in the left somatosensory, um, the left intraparietal lobule, and the left inferior parietal cortex. And they um, sort of reasoned that this might reflect an amplified sensory motor processing that the patients, uh, these individuals were doing with um, with internal focus. So with these two studies, we, um, we hypothesized that left hemisphere damaged patients will, will show um, greater deficits. So here are our participants. We had um, 20 controls and 21 patients with stroke. Um, 11 controls performed a task with their right hand. Um, and nine controls performed a task with their left hand. Um, right hemisphere damaged patients, um, there were 11 of them and left hemisphere damage were 10. Um, and as you can see, their Fugelmeyer is significantly uh, lower. And so these patients performed with their good side. So with their um, so-called the ipsilesional arm, um, which was uh, pretty good right here. So we are, we are really um, circumventing the execution deficits here and focusing on um, motor um, performance and planning. 
So we had a task that was similar to the classic end state comfort experiments uh, where participants were tested for their ability to plan for and execute a grasp that ensured a more comfortable position at the end of the task accomplishment. Um, so in the external focus condition, um, a, a dowel that was painted half white and half red um, was kept here at the beginning of the trial block. Participants were instructed to reach for um, the block uh, of the dowel, grasp it and place the red end of the dowel vertically into this um, red target hole. And so this um, provision of color matching really um, aimed at participants focus on task relevant external effects of the movement. So when they had to put the red end when it was on the right side um, into the red target hole, they would reach for this in the overhand in an overhand grasp while when the um when the when the red end was on the left they it would be beneficial to reach for it reach for it in the underhand grasp grasp it and put it into this um target hole so this was really based on the end state comfort uh, kind of experiment we also had a control condition that was um used for um used to account for general differences in motor performance across groups and that was this happened right after the externally focused conditions um, and here they were supposed to just pick it up and put it on a lower level without so here they really do not need to um, choose a grasping posture and in the third condition which is the uh, internally focused condition um, the participants were instructed to reach and grasp a neutral color dowel. So we did not want to kind of give them any external focus, uh, where here they were asked to grasp this neutral colored, neutral colored dowel with either their thumb up or thumb down posture um, that aligned really well with uh, the external focus. And they were asked to grasp that and put a specified end into the target hole. We really focused on the initial reach to grasp action. So we did not really look at once what happened after they grasped. Our focus was really on the initial reach to grasp action. Um, and we measured uh, total movement time. That was overall motor performance, uh, reach peak velocity, and coordination between reach and grasp. Um, we also looked at uh, movement planning efficiency, which was time to peak velocity. Um, and time to peak grasp aperture. So if you look at um, this, these velocity profiles and uh, the grasp aperture profile, so the one in red is the reach velocity profile and the one in um, whatever that pink is, is the grasp aperture. So the time to peak grasp aperture uh, would essentially um, indicate their motor planning efficiency and time to peak velocity so time from in starting to time to peak velocity would indicate motor planning efficiency while total movement time um, and reach peak velocity and the coordination between this peak velocity and the grasp aperture would indicate overall motor performance so for the first hypothesis um, we looked at the external focused conditions alone and uh, what we found was uh, there was a significant effect of uh, group by, um, by movement conditions. So what we saw was in patients with left hemisphere damage, uh, the normalized time to peak grasp aperture, there was a significant difference between um, overhand and underhand condition uh, between the LHD group. There were no other uh, significant differences. Um, this suggests that with when planning for grasp aperture using an underhand condition, uh, patients with left hemisphere damage had um, significantly longer time to peak grasp aperture. So significant uh, uh, greater deficits in planning of the initial grasp, particularly in the underhand condition, uh, only in the left hemisphere damaged group. Um, and also there was a 
uh, significantly longer uh, cross correlation time lag. So the coordination between reach and grasp was also affected only in the left hemisphere group, left hemisphere damage group. Um, this shows the performance for both overhand and underhand uh, trials um, during external and internal force, focus of attention. Um, and what you see is um, there was a significant main effect of instruction on uh, normalized uh, uh, total movement time and uh, re peak reach velocity such that um, with internally focused instructions, um, there was a significantly there was a uh, there was a significant delay in the total movement time that was seen predominantly for left hemisphere damage patients for both overhand and underhand trials. Also, there was a significant group by instruction uh, interaction on the time to pre peak grasp aperture um, that suggested a differential effect of instruction on planning of initial grasp aperture between groups. And as you can see here, the left hemisphere damage group shows significantly longer time to peak grasp aperture for both overhand and underhand uh, conditions in the internal focused uh, condition, but not in the external focused. So this indicated that um, with internal focused compared to external focus, the performance of goal directed reach to grasp actions was impaired in individuals with left hemisphere damage compared to controls and uh, right hemisphere damage. And uh, planning efficiency of grasping was also impaired in these patients. So the question was, why are these patients with left hemisphere damaged impaired with internal focus or external focus. Um, and one of the uh, one of the hypotheses was, are they really, is it related to Fugelmeyer? Is it related to their, um, um, you know, motor performance capabilities? And we found that there was no significant difference between um, these two groups. We further explored um, the left hemisphere damaged group and tried to identify the characteristics of patients with left hemisphere damaged who perform poorly with internal focus compared to external focus. So what I'm planning, what I'm showing you here is a median split of uh, the left hemisphere damage. So again, these are 11 patients um, and these are, um, you know, this is very exploratory analysis, but I think there is some promise here. Um, and so this is what I'm showing you here is the detriment of with internal focus compared to external focus. So this is relative time to peak grasp aperture um, uh, and a subgroup A were significantly delayed with internal focus while subgroup B um, was not significantly delayed uh, or not as significantly delayed. Um, when we look at their WOB scores, um, you see that they are pretty similar. There are no, you know, uh, our cutoff is around four. So their WOB scores on their comprehension were similar. But, um, and so I was like, this is not related to their, um, um, you know, comprehension of the task. However, Tessa kind of looked more in details at the elements of WOB and looked at um, aspects of finger agnosia and right left discrimination. And we found that there was a significant sort of difference. Um, again, I don't want to make a big deal of it with 10 patients, but what you see is that the subgroup A had significantly um, more incorrect items um, or significantly less correct items on finger agnosia um, compared to the subgroup B. And so it might be that patients with LHD who have more profound deficits in finger identification and right left discrimination um, have are, are more disproportionately impaired when provided with uh, internally focused instructions. So in summary, um, individuals with left hemisphere damage demonstrate deficits in initial grasp and grasp planning and temporal coordination. And this is um, there is this is there is evidence 
uh, there is prior evidence to suggest that, and so we confirmed that. Uh, however, the finding that internal focus of attention was detrimental to motor performance uh, and planning of these grasping actions in LHD, in patients with LHD, was a new finding. Um, and it is, we think that this might be related to deficits in finger agnosia and right left discrimination. And so, um, the effects of instruction and demonstration that provide reference to a body posture um, for stroke survivors may differ depending on the site of lesion. Again, this is a sa small sample uh, with this study. We can't really um, isolate the precise mechanisms that are related to detrimental effects. Um, is it conscious processing? Is it concurrent processing of the two? Um, internal focus and external focus, we do not know. Um, we do not know if these performance detriments will persist with practice. We know that some, some manipulations that interfere with performance are actually better for learning, so we don't know. Um, and lastly, um, there, is, there is a lot of discussion in our lab about the role of these instructions and the effects that these instructions might have on some um, metacognitive constructs such as sense of agency or self-efficacy and reinvestment. Um, we really don't know how these processes influence um, the use of these instructions in individuals with stroke. So in summary, um, instructions directing focus of attention during actions do influence performance and learning in neurotypical individuals. Uh, however, the current evidence in unilateral in patients with stroke is pretty inconsistent and prior research has not really accounted for individual differences and um, we our preliminary data suggests that cognitive deficits secondary to stroke may modulate these differential effects of internal and external focus of attention um, on motor performance. Yes, Laurel. Hi, yes, thank you, Shailesh, that was really interesting. Um, I have a suggestion uh, for you. So, um, Gerstmann syndrome is finger agnosia, left-right confusion, dysgraphesthesia, and acalculia. That's a classic, those are four symptoms that cluster together, and they are a hallmark of parietal, left parietal damage. And in, your, in the fMRI data that you showed, which was very interesting, the internal focus of instruction pushed the activation more posteriorly into the parietal lobe, right? That was a main difference between external and internal focus. Um, and what is a big parietal lobe, left parietal deficit? Limb apraxia, mm -hmm. right? And limb apraxia is very likely, I think, in your data to be the core deficit that makes internal focus difficult. In our labs, Aaron and I, and, uh, and, and Amanda, and you've been part of it too, we talked a lot about how internal focus of attention, which is really a, a postural cue, may relate also to sort of the, the proprioception and the somatosensory senses as, a, as compared to the visual. Um, and then, and so one of the things you may be getting at are these patients who do have trouble within the left hemisphere are the more, more posterior, the more parietal ones, whereas the patients who do okay with the internal focus are more anterior or have p lesions sparing the parietal lobe. So I don't think it's just left right. I, I think no, I I mean, as, a, as a next step, I think you can be more fine grained. And one final thing, I want to send you a paper um, of mine with Solen Kalanin looking at means, um, action means versus outcome processing um, and, showing, uh, it, and showing that patients, uh, it, this is in actually in um, recognition in observation of actions and showing that patients who have parietal, left parietal damage are impaired in uh, discriminating actions that differ in their means, how they're performed, but they're intact on the outcome 
like whether light turns on or off, the goal happens or not. Whereas more anterior patients have show the, the reverse pattern. So I think those two, the, I know I've, I've said a lot here in my comment, but it's an area I've studied and, and done a lot of work in. So no, I think that is, that is, that is, that is, that is definitely that, that could be um, likely. I mean, this was a first stab at the whole internal external focus and uh, this whole hemispheric specialization was really the first stab at it. And I right. agree with you that it is, um, it is related to, um, you know, where the lesion is anterior versus posterior. And the praxia. And you may want to look at your, so we looked at, look at my data. Yeah. Um, so we looked at, so of, of these left hemisphere damaged patients, um, we looked at the, some of the apraxia data that was available for some of these patients. And um, what we basically saw was the low performing left hemisphere damaged subgroup um, scored lower on the semantic gesture recognition items. But that was, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to explain that. I, I really am not. Um, and I think we talked about this very briefly and mm -hmm. we, we really came to a I don't know if you remember that, but we. Well, that's a, a test of knowledge of what gestures are supposed to look like. So, mm. it, but we can talk about that again later. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Because I, I think this is this is a very unexplored area and I would really mm -hmm. kind of um, potentially put a grant in um, looking mm. at these processes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Shailish, um, uh, I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed the talk, and um, you know, these days especially, I tend to look at things a lot through the lens of the rehabilitation treatment specification system. And uh, if people who are familiar with that know that you know the that treatments and rehabilitation fall into three groups. One of which is skills and habits, which involves practicing, which is probably the majority of the treatments that we do in rehab. And then if you think about that group, they all in a very simple dichotomy involve uh, presenting the patient with some sort of template of what behavior you want to see, and then giving them an opportunity to attempt to approximate that, that template. Um, and, and so we've, we've tried to separate those two and focus on what we refer to as the volition ingredients, which are those instructional ingredients that provide the template. And of course, it might be do what I do. It might be a, you know, a, a, a mimicry. It might be a verbal description. It might be biofeedback. It might be all kinds of things. But I think what you're really pointing out is that there are sort of lawful ways to dig into those instructional sets. We've just tended to sort of feel like, well, if you get the patient to do it, you gave them what was needed but you're suggesting that it goes beyond that and moreover that, that there will be patient specific selections of that instructional template too, which I think is a really uh, powerful thought. Thank you. I think, I think the, the I, I agree with you and I think it is, I have also changed, I mean, my, my thinking has also evolved in terms of practice, you know, I mean, I came from a, very practice, you know, you have them practice and they are going to benefit whether it is this way or that way. And there is a lot of evidence to suggest that. Sure. Yeah. But I think with these instructions and the focus of instructions, you might, I think as a clinician, you might uh, motivate them in a different way. Um, and that might, that might be actually as important as the practice itself. Um, so I, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about these and I don't have clear answers of what is going to be, uh, the ingredient, but I think I agree with you that these are, these are important. Um, thanks. thanks, John. Dylan. Shalish, I have a question if I might. Um, yes. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, I learned a lot. I was fascinated by the slide. In the background, you presented a slide on the task dependence 
of, I think it was by Fazzoli and colleagues. No, I forget who the author was, but it's lower body versus upper body and how it might be different according to the task. Um, but the point being is that um, I'm wondering the extent to which this matters for sort of overlearned or less attentional demanding tasks. Um, so I think there's a task dependence for sure based on this and it seems to make sense to me. So it might not be this patient needs this. It, uh, to me, it's more the combination of that <laughs> plus the consideration of the task. And the final element is um, I th my understanding at least of motor skill learning is there's a switching point where um, uh, and internally things that you focus on internally switch to more automated and you're focusing less on them so you can have attentional demand for other things. So just to add a little bit of complexity and I could be wrong, others might correct me, but I'm thinking that there's a task dependence as well as the patient features and there's a timing dependence according to the, the, um, the where you are in that spectrum of, of acquisition of that skill where it might change. Just a comment. No, I, I agree. I think, you, I mean, you kind of big picture nailed it that, you know, whatever we study in our labs is what happens in our labs. The extent to which that can be generalized to um, a patient environment is we currently do not have a clear idea of how it generalizes and how well it generalizes. So I think that is something which we need to keep it at the back of our mind when we talk about translation. Um, and I, I agree with you that it is going to be task dependent. The research on this, um, this, this sort of uh, the stage of learning is quite, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a topic of hot debate in this area um, with some people suggesting that the way it is studied is very different. And, you know, the, a lot of these, a lot of these studies that have tried to assess this, these differential effects of internal and external focuses on novices um, and experts have, have a lot of confounds in terms of um, the, the, the nature of feedback that they give and the nature of instructions that they give. Um, and in a lot of these tasks, the external focused um, instructions really are, are so integral to the task performance that you cannot ignore those. So people have tried to study that, but I don't think it has been studied in a very systematic way. Any other questions? So this is this is something that's quite interesting. And my interest in this sort of came more so after our prelim preliminary findings and the fact that my student got a million dollars. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well done on that. While we have the uh, the speech and language experts here, I noticed that you had, uh, you know, the interaction. You talked about the wob as a um, as an un your reason for doing that was to see whether they understood the instructions correctly. I, I, I thought, but um, I'm really curious about the interaction between uh, you know action language and and action whether there was something else, whether there could be something else that's related to their other elements of their speech and language assessment and their motor. Um, I think the interaction that Laurel pointed out between um, apraxia and this effect is, is kind of quite interesting to me as well, because the question is- Amen. <laughs> Where are we going? Eileen, you're mute. 
I, I think the question is um, sort of which one of this is primary? You know, is it is it that I don't know the literature in this. Do patients with apraxia have these deficits of agnosia and like right left discrimination? Yes. And so is it is it is this the primary deficit and apraxia is a secondary and then this becomes a tertiary or I don't know how they interact. I don't have an answer for that. I'm just I, I think they are the communication piece is going to be very important here because um well, what's the theory of why, why finger agnosia or right left discrimination would, I mean, I think the, theoretically it's much clearer how apraxia could relate to a problem with paying attention to body postures since what's what their problem is, they can't produce body postures accurately. So it, it's a, it's a direct, it's, it, it makes True, sense. If, so I what, know, if I don't know what is, you know, if I don't know up, down, right, left, um or if i don't know which you know which body part has to be aligned in a particular way would that have an effect on producing or um interpreting body postures the way the right left discrimination is tested is asking people it's a language uh, it's re relating language to direction so it, we could talk more. Let's talk more yeah, about it. Know, so it's hard to understand how that would relate. Yeah, we can we can talk about it. This is not my happy to happy to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Because I I a part of me wants to and go into this, but a part of me is like if, if it becomes too nebulous. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, a, a, a multiple regression model would be certainly a way to to mm -hmm. look at what 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 which which of these things accounts for the most variance in your dependent measure, which is what sure, you're asking. Sure, sure. All right. Thank you guys. You guys have been a kind audience. I was really worried about it because I had very minimal time to even look at the research and uh, things after my grant submission. So I was like, <laughs> deer in headlights, but I think it went okay. Thanks a lot, Liz. That was terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.